All right, I forgot the transition. Good morning and good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is Good Twos News Day. We are will be covering all sorts of positive and happy news going on this week, including giant bugs swarming the U.S. Because everyone loves a good bug swarm. Let's go ahead and get into our headlines today on Before Coffee. A victory for everyone. Swiss climate seniors win in court. And on Good Twos News Days, we have stories about cicadas and salmons. Girl's jacket kept her afloat until rescuers saved her from the sea in Dune Lager during Storm Kathleen. And we talk about more good news on Good Twos News Day as we discuss green funerals. And in culture news, Entente Cordial. How France and the UK became friends. And good news, it is National Unicorn Day, April 9th, 2024, on Before Coffee. Okay, our first news story coming out of Switzerland. This is from Euronews and is written by, it's just, yeah, it's just written by Euronews. They're the one. I drop in the ba- big, big breaking news of victory for all of us. Swiss so climate seniors have achieved a historic success with their lawsuit before the European Court of Human Rights, or the ECHR, in Strasbourg. It is the first time that the court has condemned a state for its lack of initiative in the fight against climate change. After climate seniors fought in Swiss courts for several years and ultimately suffered defeat in the federal court, the highest court in the country, they took the case to the European Court of Human Rights. Three climate lawsuits should be concluded there today on April 9th. So, in addition to the EU states, they also blamed Switzerland and Great Britain for their lack of action against climate change. Wow, they specifically... You guys did this! Uh, they complained from the French mayor, who also called for greater government efforts to combat climate change, was not completely but largely rejected. Your victory is a victory for all of us. Lawyers for all three parties have hoped that Strasbourg Court would find the national governments have a legal obligation to ensure that global warming is kept at 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre industrial levels, in line with the goals of Paris Climate Agreement. I really hoped that we would win against all the countries, so of course I'm disappointed that didn't happen," said 19-year-old Solia Oliveira, one of the Portuguese plaintiffs. But the most important thing is that the Swiss women's case, the, wait, the Swiss women's case, the court said that the government must reduce their emissions more to protect human rights. But the victory is also a victory for us and a victory for everyone. Six young people from Portugal who filed a Europe-wide lawsuit were unsuccessful. They are already confronted with the consequences of the climate crisis and fear for their future. The fires that raged in their country in 2017 prompted the young people to file the lawsuit to begin with. So, it's a short story, but it's a positive story. Um, not everyone has won their lawsuits against their government for not doing anything about climate change, but this specific Switzerland group has won in the ECHR. Um, the ECHR is really important for anybody who doesn't know because they basically determine if all the countries in the EU are following the basic human rights that they've all agreed to. So in some cases, you as a citizen in the EU can, if you're not getting any justice in your country, you can take it to the ECHR and they can say, yeah, you have to, this isn't right. You can't do this to people living in your country. Uh, I can only think of one famous court case right now famous well it's a court case I studied in school and it was a failure but it was the court case of a Belgian immigrant he immigrated to Belgium and they said I should be allowed to bring my parents with me and then they said no you're not <laughs> unfortunately both the Belgium and ECHR um, said that's not a human right to be allowed to have your parents with you you're only allowed to bring your children. You're not allowed to bring your parents. It's a one-way street, unfortunately. Though, you can definitely argue parents need to be taken care of at certain at a certain time in their age. So, in a way, they become children. So, But, unfortunately, society doesn't work that way. Society just 
Uh, I think mostly European society depends where you live. I think Eastern Europe is probably more kind of supportive when it comes to taking care of their older family members. But I think maybe uh, Western Europe is more put them in a home or something. Mm -hmm. So because we have, I mean, there's one here in the village I live in. There's a a, a re retirement home full of people. So somebody they're going somewhere. <laughs> But there's your successful happy news. We did it. At least in Europe. We have people are suffering and it's your fault, governments, and you need to try harder because people's houses are being caught on in on fire because of how hot it is. <laughs> yeah. Your story. Okay. And uh, good news Tuesday. Good Tuesday day. We have a salmon spill. A salmon spill, you ask. This is from Good Good News Network. Andy Corbley, a good old correspondent. He's the only person that works there, apparently. But hey, <laughs> hardworking guy. And of course, he just he just does the Huffington Post things. He pulls stories from all over the country and organizes them on one website so we can easily find them. And this is 100,000 salmon spill off a truck in Oregon and most land in a creek and survive. Disaster struck a truck transporting 102,000 young salmon to a hatchery in Oregon when it overturned on the road and the giant fish tank it was carrying burst open. However, what luck was on the side of the small fries, almost all of whom rode the, wa rode the wave of water out of the tank and into Looking Grass Creek, the waterway which connects with the hatchery they were traveling to. The driver had just left the local hatchery in Elgin, Oregon, about 300 miles east of Portland with 800,000 pounds of salmon and water. His eventual destination was the Imnaha River near Looking Glass Hatchery in Northeast Oregon. But when, with the early morning dew on the roads, the driver skidded while heading around the sharp curve and the yaw of water-filled container brought it down onto its side before sending it sliding over the road and down into a rocky embankment. It was one of the worst disasters in the history of the program dating back to 1982, which brings salmon smolts or young salmon from river hatcheries downstream to hatcheries stopped up by dams far upstream. While 24,000 of the smolts weren't able to flop their way from the bank, 77,000 were. Typically, the smolts are brought up to the river hatcheries a short time before their venture journey to the Pacific Ocean. At their destination in the Imnaha River, they were meant to assimilate for a few days before their 65, I'm sorry, 650 mile journey through the Snake and Columbia Rivers to the Pacific. They hitch a ride on the spring runoff tail first so there's less resistance. That way they can conserve energy until they get to the ocean says Andrew Gibbs, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Fish Hatchery Coordinator for Eastern Oregon in an interview every Wednesday. Even though they weren't born there, just a few days at the constructed pool in the Amnaha Ribby, it says Ribby, River is enough for them to specifically remember the route back from the ocean using a kind of reserve scent signal. By placing smolts in various rivers, creeks, and tributaries, the state ensures the salmon are running back upstream past all manner of communities, both human and animal, that rely on them for food, commerce, and recreation. They kind of smell their way back. Give said it's an incredible life history. Well, there so those salmons, most of them survived. And well, let's go down with more nature, sort of. We're going to talk about cicadas. We, those wonderful animals, those wonderful insects that show up every year for a couple of months, but there's huge, huge broods that, that show up on prime numbered years, 13 and 17 and 19. But 13 and 17 are the main ones, I guess. This is from UPI.com, Erhen Winder. Trillions of cicadas to swarm US, first double brood emergence in 200 years. Cicada broods 13 and 19 are expected to merge together for the first time in over 200 years. Thomas Jefferson was president the last time these broods co-merged. 
A rare double emergence of the cane is about to swarm the eastern United States in the coming weeks, scientists say. Brood 13, which emerges every 17 years, and Brood 19, which emerges every 13 years, will join together for the first time since 1803. Illinois will be ground zero for this historic emergence, which is expected to sweep through a dozen other states. Well, Illinois got the, was it Carbondale, Illinois got two eclipses and uh, total eclipses in, what, seven years? And now they're getting cicadas. Cicadas known for their loud chirping and tendency to leave behind mounds of exoskeletons tend to surface around April or May to reproduce before disappearing again. Well, they just go back underground and they live in tree roots. There are 15 peri periodical cicada broods in the United States, three of which emerge every 13 years and the rest every 17 years. The cicadas from broods 13 and 19 are of similar size, growing up to about 1.4 inches, but other broods can double that and have up to an eight inch wingspan. The entomologist Meredith Schrader at Auburn University said central and northern Alabama can expect millions and millions of cicadas for about six to eight weeks. Everybody's getting ready, really excited, Schrader told AI.com. So, or did he, because AI.com is AI, right? Some people are dreading it, but it'll be fun. Dr. Katie Data, an entomologist and cicada expert from Illinois, says she's been looking forward to this year's co-emergence for many years. I've been trying to spread the word. People haven't listened until this year, she told The Independent. The area with the greatest likelihood of overlap between the two broods is Springfield, Illinois. Trader said the big the bug geeks are looking forward to seeing whether the two broods will hybrid hybridize during mating season. Well, the two broods are not expected to overlap to any significant extent. Research from the University of Connecticut suggests that the two did produce hybrid offspring. They would emerge alongside the next generation of one or both of their parent broods and be indistinguishable from them. While some might dread the oncoming swarm and the damage to their ornamental, ornamental plants, people in academia are embracing it as a once in a lifetime phenomenon. Don't plant any trees because the newborn cicadas, that's what they live off for those 13 and 17 years. They just etch themselves to a tree root and that's where they are. One professor in Ohio created a free app called Cicada Safari for users to upload pictures and track where cicadas are emergency, merging with the highest density. While it's hard to imagine cicadas being tr a threatened species, scientists warned of a possible effects of climate change on yep. their population. Dana says cicadas ensure their survival by producing so many offspring that their vast numbers overwhelm natural predators like birds, snakes, and mammals. But even a small dip in the brood's emergent population due to high temperatures or deforestation cause predators to wipe them out entirely. Yeah. So there's your cicada story. They have no natural defense. They just breed like crazy and come out once, you know, theoretically once a year. But the once a year ones get wiped out. But they're because the brood's not big enough. Yeah. So the only way they can survive is just totally come out all these 17 and, and 13 year broods and just, just so literally they have to nature. swarm to survive. And you can't, they are louder than airplanes. I know this for a fact. I know it for a fact because I was sitting by uh, the, the last big outbreak a few years ago in DC. I was sitting by the National Airport in DC where planes take off every few minutes. Plane takes off, cicadas, cicadas are triggered by the plane taking off and they try to drown out the plane and they do it. They completely wow. drown out the airplane. It's That's pretty amazing, cool. Amazing phenomenon. All you can hear is cicada. No airplane. It's, it's still taking off. It's still just right there. <laughs> you can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay. Back to well, you. Well, good news for salmon and cicadas. They're not going to give up. <laughs> huh? Not so soon, anyways. <laughs> uh, we have... Like airplane, drawn it up. While salmon were going swimming, this girl was also swimming in Dune Loire, which I... Irish, so I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but she uh, got swept away in the waves, but survived due to her puffy jacket. This is from the Irish Times by Cano Lalicera. A jacket worn by a young girl swept in the sea in South Dublin during Storm Kathleen at the weekend helped to keep her floating until a rescue boat was able to reach her 
an RNLI member has said. The child, believed to be aged around seven, was walking with a man and another child near Dune Loguer's East Pier on Saturday night, which was, I believe, the 7th of April? Yeah, no, 6th of April. The 6th of April, when she fell into the water. A number of people in the area tried to rescue the girl by throwing a buoyancy, buoyancy aids at or entering the water themselves. But those efforts were not successful as the sea was too rough and she had been carried too far from the pier. One of the would-be rescuers needed assistance to get out of the water. However, members of the Dune Loguer RNLI launched their rigid inflatable boat, RIB, and managed to get close to the girl just before 8.30 p.m. Her jacket was keeping her afloat, and one of the rescuers then entered the water and reached the girl. Both were then pulled back into the boat by two others on board. The operation involved the RNLI Garda, Ambulance Service, and the Dublin Fire Brigade, while the Coast Guard's Rescue 1116 helicopter was also deployed at the time. Andrew Sykes, one of the rescuers on the RNLI lifeboat, said the crew managed to rescue the child less than nine minutes after receiving the emergency call. Within the high winds and the storm, with the high winds and the storm we were experiencing, and with large waves and surging surges coming off the pier, to get alongside her was extremely difficult, he said. We would be pushed one way, and we would be pushed another. Mr. Sykes was only was the rescue who entered the water, putting the girl on her back to ensure she could continue breathing. He then told her until his colleagues could get close enough in the RB to take the child and put him back into the boat. Oh, pull him back into the boat, sorry. She had a jacket on and capsules of air had been trapped in it. Those kept her afloat, he said, of the child bobbing around the surface of the rescue operation un as the rescue un operation unfolded. The girl was taken to hospital to be treated with her injuries, which were described as non-life-threatening. The section of the pier which the girl fell from was said to be slippery, covered by seaweed and difficult to walk on. It is understood she fell into the water during the stormy conditions, at which point the man and the other young girl she was with began to shout for help and the emergency services were notified. Storm Kathleen passed over Ireland on April 6th, toppling trees in some areas and interrupting power supplies. At its peak on the 6th, some 34,000 properties went, went without electricity, but some but the number had fallen to 2,000 by the 7th or Sunday morning. Heavy rain is expected to, in the southeast for the rest of the week. A status, a status yellow rain warning was issued for Carlow, Hilkenny, Wexford, Wicklow, and Waterford. It was to come into effect from midnight on the 7th and remain in place for 24 hours. Forecasters said possible impacts could include flooding, Poor visibility and difficult traveling conditions. Rain is to extend in most areas, though parts of the northwest country may hold dry. The rain will persist for much of the day. Some showers are expected, but with that, largely the storm is over from the weekend. And I guess tomorrow will be a dull and misty, wet without breaks or rain and drizzle continue on most of the day. So there's your weather update for Ireland. <laughs> and also, the lucky rescue of the seven-year-old girl who hopefully will not have too much trauma to deal with when cause she got swept away for nine minutes or maybe even more than nine minutes in the storm. She'll probably just forget about story. it. <laughs> she'll probably remember, just forget. She's really, really old. Yeah. And then she'll be like, why am I scared Little of the ocean? Life. Oh, that's why I got swept away in the ocean <laughs> when I was seven. But or maybe every, she'll become an Olympic swimmer. Yeah, maybe she'll conquer that fear. Right. All right, your story. She re realized her lifelong dream of, I was swimmer all the time. Swimming the channel. I don't know. Swimming yeah. the Atlantic. <laughs> maybe she's part fish. <clears throat> part fish. Hold on, I got a cough. Extend your story while I cough. I don't... I have another story. Extremely coffee. Extremely. <laughs> well, I had to clear my throat. Okay. All right. This is from Positive.News. This is about green funerals. Allison McClintock is the reporter. Thinking outside the box, eco concerns prompt greener funeral options. 
As more people seek climate-friendly end-of-life solutions, increasingly popular options include renting a flat, flat pack coffin to reduce your funeral's carbon footprint. Keeping a lid on your carbon footprint doesn't stop with your last breath. Your choice of funeral can have significant environmental impact. In a recent report by the U.S.-based National Funeral Directors Association, 60.5% of those surveyed expressed their interest in greener options, including resumination, which is water cremation, resumation, which is water cremation, human composting, and natural burials. And while the U.N.'s funeral preferences are currently split 80-20 between cremations and burials, YouGov research found that almost a third, 29% of people in the UK would choose alternative commit, committal methods if available. Sophia Campbell Shaw, founder of Woven Farewell or Farewell Coffins, is one of the UK's 10 willow coffin makers and keen to take more environmentally friendly options mainstream. The funeral sector is one of the most polluting sectors, she tells positive news from her case in from her base in Devon or Devon. One cremation uses as much energy as a 500 mile car trip and leases a staggering 400 kilos of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Traditional burials don't fare much better. In the U.S. alone, 800,000 gallons of formaldehyde is placed in the ground each year in the form of embalming fluids and Many coffins include metal, plastics, and caustic glue, she points out. From the spring, Campbell Shaw is upping her company's eco-credentials, further by offering families the option of renting rather than buying the casket. She points out that some cultures include in the U.S., rental is common. A person's memorial is held in a rented casket and the body is transferred in a cardboard coffin afterwards. To reduce the carbon footprints of her coffins, all of Campbell Shaw's materials are fully biodegradable. Her standard willow coffins are designed with materials that will biodegrade and return to compost. But now she offers a rental coffin. This is made of biodegradable materials, but designed as a flat pack of panels that can be assembled, dismantled, stored by funeral directors, and reassembled. Willow is one of the best because it is, can be grown on land prone to flooding. Copies twice a year, and once harvested, it grows right back. Willow is one of the best because it can be grown in land prone to flooding. Uh, okay, I'm reading the same thing twice. I must have been under a picture. It also provides more energy than they use to produce and produces, meaning that it is produced a net carbon negative. Car Campbell Shaw acknowledges that there are cultural and emotional barriers to be overcome in the UK, although the Federation of Burial and Cremation Authorities actively endorses the idea of renting coffins. Funeral directors can be resistant because they feel their customers won't see it as respectful. I'm lost. Why would it be respectful? <laughs> However, as president of the Association of Green Funeral Directors, William, I think that got invented by funeral directors, by the way, this whole respectful nonsense. I yeah. think totally is invented by the funeral industry, which has trapped people into thinking they go, oh, you got to spend more money than you ever would have spent on this person while they're alive, you know? Yeah, if you're not using a mahogany uh, freaking oh. casket, you hated your loved one. How about wicker? <laughs> wicker casket. I want to be buried in a mushroom in this picture. casket. So there's, there's, one, there's a picture here of a wicker casket. This is pretty <laughs> awesome. However, President, where was I? However, as President of the Association of Green Funeral Directors, William Wayman describes renting a casket as a very practical idea. After all, we enter this world with nothing and leave it with nothing more. Why should we need to own the packaging material used to carry us away? All right, exactly. What are you going to do in it anyway? You know, <laughs> nothing. Read a book or something? I don't know what you're going to do in it, right? Yeah. Campbell, ah, Campbell Shaw has also considered the storage issues of a rental casket. A rental coffin is made as a new flat pack design inspired by a customer who wanted a coffin to keep, keep in his family and store for use throughout the generations as a cherished as a cherished gown would be. It's constructed of willow panels so it can be easily assembled and disassembled with thick ply base and sturdy hemp rope handles, a cardboard Coffin sits inside. The foot end of the coffin is removable, allowing the body to be transferred with dignity after a memorial on the cream or on, on to the cremation bed 
or to the next grave for burial, or to the grave for burial. After use, after use, the casket is sanitized and stored by the funeral directors in return so it can be used again. Up to 15 times at the end of his rented life, his disassembled coffin materials are responsibly recycled. It's sanitized because you don't want these dead people to get sick from whatever killed the last dead person, right? <laughs> yeah, I get it. Sanitized. Dead people are unsanitary. Campbell's shell rental is designed as a flat pad. We did this already. And that's helping to tackle another funeral taboo, the cost, Campbell Shaw announced. The price for purchasing one of her hand-woven willow caskets ranges from, yeah. The willow caskets are actually wicker when I say willow. When you yeah. when I say willow, picture wicker. Yeah. <laughs> picture wicker, okay? All right, there we go. To rent one of her coffins and coffin over 20, 200 pounds, including delivery costs. I'm still surprised how much is frowned upon to prepare a funeral plan. In 2023, Sun Insurance figures show the cost of dying went up by 5% to 9,658 pounds sterling. Offering coffin, coffin rentals is one way of showing people that funerals don't have to be complicated. You can honor the person you've lost in a simple way. There you go. Get into that green funeral business, I guess. Wicker coffins, baby. <laughs> Let them worms eat. Let them eat. Back to you. <laughs> Let the worms eat. Okay. <laughs> like I said, I've always wanted to like to get buried in, into a tree or in like one of those mushroom caskets where the mushrooms just eat your body. Totally think that's fine. I don't want anyone finding my body and making up a story about me in an archaeological dig, okay? I'm not going to be here. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> nah, I was thinking about being dehydrated and stuffed and putting in taxidermy. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that one. <laughs> I wonder how popular that is. But not very. I, I think saw it's an Ameri the opposite of popular. <laughs> I saw an American Pickers episode the other day where this guy owns, Dale, remember Dale Evans, Roy, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, you know, the cowboy. Yeah. The cowboy show. Roy and Dale are married. Well, this guy owns Dale Evans, who is Roy Rogers' wife. He owns he owns Dale Evans's horse. I mean, the horse has been stuffed, taxidermy, like perfectly preserved, like a in a museum. And he owns it it's like in his garage, a famous <laughs> actor's horse, and he's just got it in his garage. And these guys stumble across it. He goes, and they go, you, he's not even selling it. It's just not even presented anywhere. It's like I'm sure she had her. I'm sure she had her horse stuff so she could have it in some guy's garage in, you know, Oakland, yeah, California or something. Totally. What the hell? Anyway, this is another option. <laughs> another people option. To get stuff, that's another option. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I, we I only use cassettes to carry our bodies, by the way. Uh, that's the only reason they exist. You pick somebody up and put them in a hole. So, yeah, you don't need, we don't need caskets. But or we a do bag need them of skin. To, I think it's better to lift people in a box than to like I don't know, carry like a a guy who's dead just like on a bunch of like just holding him. I guess you could do that. I guess a bunch of people could just hold him in their hand. But yeah, it's just a basket. It's a it's a person basket. All right, in our cultural news, let's talk about how France and the UK became friends because everyone out there needs to learn how to become friends with your deepest en enemies or at least contentual political bodies that you're always fighting. This is from Amber Louise Bryce. It was the beginning of a beautiful, if complicated, friendship. 120 years ago today, the United Kingdom and French Republic signed a series of agreements aimed at resolving conflicts between the two nations and strengthening their alliance in the face of an increasingly powerful German military. Thanks, Germany! It became a pivotal moment in European history, not only redefining the relationship between two of the world's most powerful countries, but also a key to shaping the continent's political landscape throughout the 20th century. British and French troops paid tribute on the anniversary by taking part in the traditional changing of the guard ceremony, but swapping palaces. 16 bearskin hat wearing British soldiers from the number no. 7 company Coldstream Guards joined the 32 members of the Gendarmerie Garda Republicaine Mount Guard at the Elise Pal Palace in 
Elsie is wait, Elise? El El Elsie? Elsie? Palace in Paris. <laughs> they were visited by French President Emmanuel Macron and British Ambassador to France, Menya Rawlings. Why wasn't where was the like the royals or somebody? Meanwhile, 32 members of the in Darmeri's Guard Republican marched with 40 guardsmen from the F Company Scots Guard at Buckingham Palace. Okay, so on behalf of King Charles III, they were greeted by Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh alongside the French ambassador. The, old, the king didn't even go, man. What the hell? No respect. French should take this as an insult and they should start another one. I'm just kidding. This is the first time a country from outside the Commonwealth has taken part in the changing of the guard ceremony in London. What is Entente Cordial? Relations uh, haven't always been in rock between England and France, to say the least. The two headstrong countries with powerful global influence and a history of wars, 41 to be exact. In the early 20th century, there were various conflicts still simmering, especially regarding colonial disputes in North Africa. The Entente Cordial put these to bed, establishing diplomatic harmony between the countries. It also became somewhat of a necessity, with the growing fears over Germany's rising militant powers and founding of the Triple Alliance, a secret pact with Austria-Hungary and Italy. Signed a decade before the war, World War I began, the Cordial was the start of a powerful alliance that created a template for unity and peace across Europe. In 1949, England and France, along with 12 other countries from Europe and North America, founded NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization to protect against the Soviet Union's nuclear threats. Perhaps the best example of a more modern-day Anglo-French unity is the Channel Tunnel. Unveiled in May 6, 1994, I can't believe it's as old as me. That's crazy. I thought it was way newer than that. I didn't know it was 30 years old. Basically, that's. I wonder if they're gonna celebrate that on, on May, May sixth, the Channel Tunnel anniversary. That's crazy, yeah, the thirtieth anniversary of so many things. Nineteen ninety four was the year, I guess. I guess I should, I should feel special that I was born in such a great year. They also didn't they also abolish the apartheid in nineteen ninety four? Like there's so much great stuff that happened in nineteen ninety four, including me. It's still considered one of the most <laughs> impressive feats of the 20th century infrastructure, completely innovating mobility between the UK and the rest of Europe. Frenemies? I was going to say this in our social media post, the <laughs> British and French frenemies, but <laughs> they got me here in the article. It's all been smooth sailing, of course. Like any friendship, France and England have had their differences. The latter, and former Prime Minister Boris Johnson in particular, complicating matters by leaving the European Union in 2020. It was a classic case of an anxious avoidant causing abandonment issues in their partner and a whole lot of financial mess. But 120 years later, they're still together and working through their issues. I think they should also mention that France was abhorrently against the UK joining the EU. For many years, they tried to join in, I think, 17, uh, 1976 and uh, de Gaulle, which is a famous general, but he also became president later, was like, we are not letting the British in. Because they're going to join, take all of the the good stuff, and then fuck off. And that's exactly what they did. They had the most amount of EU support for any EU member state, and then they just left for whatever. How, how many years were they in the EU? I think maybe 30 years or something. They were in the EU. And then they were like, thanks guys, we're out of here. I, it's crazy that the goal predicted this in like back in the freaking 70s or the 60s even that oh yeah they're gonna join we can totally let them in but they're just gonna leave anyways I know the British <laughs> take advantage then leave <laughs> so that probably also complicated that when the, the French fr the French kept on denying their application they tried to join three times before they actually entered into the EU In a positive symbolic move, King Charles III and Queen Camilla made their very first state visit to France last year. While there, and a purportedly feasting on blue lobster, the king referenced the importance of the Entente Cordiale in a statement. The connections between our people are myriad. I represent the lifeblood of our Entente Cordiale, which was inspired by my great-great-grandfather, King Edward VII. He continued, It is incumbent upon us all to reinvigorate our friendship. Ensure it is fit for the challenges of this, the 21st century. 
Hear, hear, and viva la besties. <laughs> viva la besties. Uh, but uh, there you go. Even you, if you have a problem with somebody, just sign an agreement against the common enemy of uh, Axe's powers, and you can also become frenemies with your long standing 41 ward enemy. And uh, happy 30 years, or 120 years, sorry, to that burgeoning friendship. Not me, I'm not going. Not Monte, me, I'm uncompromising. Oh, do we want to cover, I guess we want to cover huh? just the, the winners and the losers here on our March Madness. It's done now. We could. Yeah. It won't take that long. Did you, did you total your points? Yep, I have my paper here. So let's just go over what we p picked for anybody who doesn't know. For the college okay. basketball the in the U.S. My men's Final Four, I had UConn and Alabama, NC State and Purdue, with Purdue winning. Now, the actual reality is that it was uh, UConn who won against Alabama, so no points for me there. Uh, yeah. NC State did lose to Purdue, so I got a point there. But unfortunately, UConn won against Purdue, so I did not get the final champion game winner. UConn was the winner this time. What did you pick? for the men's tournament. I got all of them wrong. I picked three games, got all three wrong, so zero points. <laughs> I picked I picked Alabama, I picked North Carolina State, so since I picked both losers, I could not possibly pick the winner, could I? Well, so, you won the losers yeah. round. Woohoo! They don't they don't get a losers round in this bracket. Yeah, woo, yep. <laughs> And uh, went, m the women's final four, I picked all three games right. So I got the maximum total amount of points for this. Nice. Ten points and I got ten points in the final four and six points in the final because I picked the winner. Yep, so I I chose. I 16 points. Oh, 16 points in the women's final four and zero in the men's final four. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. And for my That's women's it. tournament, I chose uh, South Carolina winning, Iowa winning, and then Iowa going on to win the championship. Unfortunately, South Carolina won, so I did not get the championship, but I got the final four correct. So I guess and I can't my complain. total points for men. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't really told my up total my points, points for men was. But uh, I did well. I'm just gonna give it. You, give it. you can do it while I'm doing my story, but. Uh, uh, I'm gonna, I added them up here. 35 total points all rounds for the men. And I stopped earning points in the Sweet 16. I did not earn one single point after the Sweet 16 in the men's tournament. In the women's tournament, let's see, 12, 24, 44, 56, 68, How 70, many points 84 points. How for the 16 points. round? Yeah, eight, yeah, because it's more chalky. Um, how much points for the, the the six sweet sixteen? Oh, for the opening round in the, the first, you know, the first eight. The sixty four and the thirty two. Those are all eight. one point, right? Yeah. Those are all one. The yeah. round of thirty two is each worth two points. Okay. The sweet sixteen is worth three points. The lead eight is worth four. The final four is worth five, and no championship is worth six. It's very simple scoring. Just go by round at a point. Did I even did Except I even win any round. in the the eight? Well, we'll worry about that later. I'm gonna do my stories while <laughs> you figure out your points because I've already given mine. All right, this day in history, eight thirteen eighty eight, the Battle of Naples came, came, culminated in a major victory for the Swiss Confederation in the first century of struggle for self determination against the Habsburg overlordship. How would you like to live in a Habsburg overlordship? I don't. I wonder if that's what they actually called it. In 1682, René Robert Cavier, Sir Lord de la Salle, Salle, claimed the Mississippi River Basement for France, naming it Louisiana. In 1865, General Robert E. Lee, commander of the Army of Northern Virginia and the Confederate States of United America, did the most honorable thing of his life and signed the Treaty of Surrender at the Appomattox Courthouse, effectively ending the Civil War. In 1898, Paul Robeson, a celebrated American singer, actor, and political activist, was born. So happy birthday to Paul Robeson. Coincidentally on this day, African-American and also 
singer Marian Anderson sang to an Easter Sunday crowd of 75,000 at the Lincoln Memorial after the Daughters of the American Revolution refused to allow her to sing at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. Daughters of the American Revolution, just another racist organization celebrating white people. Another useless fucking organization just formed to say, we're better than you somehow. We decided because we formed an organization. We must be better. <laughs> 1963, an act of Congress conferred honorary U.S. citizenship on Sir Winston Churchill. In 1965, the Astrodome opened in Houston, Texas, hosting the first indoor baseball game. In 2001, American Airlines officially completed its acquisition of Transworld Airlines, TWA, and became the world's largest airline. In 2005, Charles, who is now king, but in mm -hmm. 2005, he was Prince of Wales, and he married his, who married Camilla Parker Bowles on his day in 2005. It says Ooh. he's first in line to the British throne, who was first in line. What's that? Boo, I said. Camilla Parker. Oh, boo. Justice yeah, because for, we all like Princess Guy. And yeah, we, we all think she was murdered. <laughs> it's, it's by a team of assassins on that Paris street. A dark, dark, dark overpass. On this day in 2003, our featured event is the fall of Baghdad. Baghdad fell to U.S.-led forces on this day in 2003. Several weeks after the start of the Iraq war, a conflict began uh, to host pre Iraqi President Saddam Hussein because, because of his supposed possession of weapons of mass destruction. So basically, yeah. Basically, George Bush vendetta war. That's what that yeah. was. That's all it was. Nothing else. Our featured biography is Jorn, Jorn Uzton, a Danish architect. Born April 9th, 1918, in Copenhagen, Copenhagen, or Copenhagen, Denmark. And died November 29th, 2008, age 90. And they're showing a picture of the Sydney Opera House. So I'm guessing he's the one that designed it? I guess so. I guess so. And featured birthdays today Charles Baudelaire, French author, born 1821. Ed, Ed Weird, Ed Weird. My Bridge, British photographer, born in 1830. Leopold II, King of Belgium, was born in this day in 1835. Mary Pickford, Canadian-born American actress, born in 1892. And Hugh Hefner, a playboy, a guy started a playboy. American publisher and entrepreneur, was born on this day in 1926. He would be 98. He did not cheat death forever, as he did die a few years ago. And what day is it today? It is National Cherish an Antique Day. So go hug your old vase and your old, old clock and whatever you got that just you can't you can't get rid of it. It's part of you. Cherish it. National Name Yourself Day. Okay. I name myself uh, Happy Boy. I don't know. I'm Happy <laughs> Boy. Anyway, there is that National Name Yourself Day. So go name yourself. Hey, go name yourself. National Chinese Almond Cookie Day. That's very specific. Chinese Almond Cookie. They showed a picture of a cookie and it's got the split almond in the middle, like right in the middle. Yeah. On top. So that's the giveaway. It's National Winston Churchill Day. As we noted before, he was made an honorary U.S. citizen on his day, so I imagine that's what that comes from. It's National Library Workers Day. Appreciate your library workers because, by golly, they walk around telling everybody to be quiet all day. National Former Prisoner of War Recognition Day. Yes, prisoner of war are probably in deep, dark places in their mind you'll never see. They ought to be treated with respect. And it's, of course, National Unicorn Day. Because if you have a unicorn, take good care of your unicorn. Make sure you feed it three times a day. None of that crap food. None of that store-bought unicorn food either. <laughs> that natural stuff. 
Unicorn is also the national animal of Scotland. Are you... Fun fact. Okay. Is that right? Yeah. That's our national well, animal. Those are, the, those are the days for today. April 9th, 2024 on Before Coffee. Okay, I don't know if I did the math properly because I had to do it fast, but I got 59 points in the men's tournament and 39 in the women's tournament. So, I killed you in the women's tournament and then you beat me in the men's tournament. Yeah, I guess I... I well, What's like you said before, going chalk with women's is the safer option, but going kind of crazy in the men's is more likely to actually do something weird. So, it's still sad that, I probably would have won if I would have just... It's Just still sad to me Carolina that Purdue State and UConn were the, the final game there, but... I guess you gotta pick it's the sad. easy picks right there. UConn and Purdue yeah. are easy picks for the men's tournament. I'm having trouble picking up your audio. Okay. Anyways... Your audio is a little choppy on my end. That's probably your internet. Uh, either way, that is our episode of Good Twos Newsday here on... Before coffee, we will see you tomorrow for Wacky and Weird Wednesday as we cover the weird news that's been happening out there this week. Here is your mic drop moment. Genius! Genius draws no color line. And so it is fitting that Marian Anderson should raise her voice in tribute to the noble Lincoln whom mankind will ever honor. Miss Marian Anderson. Be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.